So let's start. And uh, so what is GraphQL and especially what it isn't? So despite the name, GraphQL is not a query language. <laughs> so it does not look like SQL. It does not look like JCR SQL. So that's the first thing you have to get out of your mind. That's what confused me the most when I started with GraphQL. Um, it is not a URL specification, meaning that it doesn't specify anything about the URL. You want it, if, the opposite to other things like REST, uh, you will not hear anything uh, about that. It is also not a final standard, which can be a little bit of a nuisance. Um, it's also not submitted to a standard body, meaning that for the moment, uh, Facebook, which are the people that are behind GraphQL, uh, have put out a specification that's not, you know, accepted by a standard update or anything. So it's uh, a facto standard, meaning that uh, they're hoping that the community will will accept it and uh, work with it. Uh, also, it's not a 100% JSON standard either, uh, which might be strange because we're used to now either using XML or JSON when we're doing uh, web requests, but this is not JSON as you'll see. At least half of it is not. And it's also not a mature standard. Uh, things are changing all the time. Uh, just for preparing this presentation and demo, uh, had some issues because the specification had changed on some part of the request. <clears throat> so on the first part, uh, you describe your data. So this is very different from other uh, standards like REST. The first thing you do is you define what your data looks like to a schema. So you say, for example, here I have a project that has a name of type string and then a tagline of type string and contributors that is an array of users, okay? And users is another object defined in my schema. Uh, then basically, once you have this schema defined, you do the actual what is called query. So you have the the query on the object of type project. And here we give an argument that says I want a project called GraphQL, and then I'm requesting the field tagline uh, inside that project. So the tagline is one of the fields I defined up on the uh, on the first uh, line, uh, first box, and then I get you get a result that is that is a JSON result. So everything you've seen until now is not JSON. Okay, it's all specific to GraphQL, uh, but the result is JSON. And here I get an object called project with a tagline that says a query language for API. So I get this uh, field or property if you want out of it. So that's basically in one. Uh, very dark uh, slide, uh, <laughs> what you should be seeing. But don't worry, I'll come back to it in more detail. Before we go into the details, um, I want to talk about who's using GraphQL. So here we have a lot of uh, very large users. Of course, Facebook uh, are the ones that are behind it. So they are the ones that are the biggest components of it. GitHub is a very uh, recent adopter. Uh, so all the GitHub APIs, uh, are accessible, at least part of them are accessible uh, through GraphQL, Pinterest, and I'm not that familiar with the others, but there's a longer list. And we could actually, if we started using it, uh, you can do pull requests to be added to the list of users. So uh, it's very easy to uh, to add it. So, well, I thought about this coming on the way. So how could we actually, you know, get you into it very quickly? And uh, I'd like to start with a quick demo. Um, because there's a product called GraphQL Hub that makes it very easy to use existing GraphQL APIs and, and just play with them. So this is what I'll do. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to uh, GraphQL Hub. Up. And so here, basically, what they offer is that they offer GraphQL uh, views of all the different APIs, uh, like Hacker News, Reddit, GitHub, and Twitter, and so forth. So I'm just going to use the GitHub one. And here you see that basically it's giving me already a, 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 a GraphQL query uh, predefined that I can play with. And so what I'll do here is uh, I'll, I'll change the username so you know I'm not cheating, and uh, change it to my GitHub account. 
And here I'll change the name of the project to one of my repositories. And uh, basically then here with this uh, little application, I can just execute the query. And this basically pulls the data from Twitter, uh, from, from GitHub, and uh, gives like the latest comments and stuff like that. Now, one of the things I want to show, uh, one of the things that's nice about GraphQL is that you can really control the output. Because what, what happens a lot with, uh, with JSON requests is that you get a lot of data and you might not need all of that data. And so you end up doing all kinds of things like where you specify which properties you want and all these kinds of things. And it's always kind of hacky. Uh, this is a, a real part of GraphQL. So let's say, for example, that I, I'm not interested in the branches. I could just say here, I want to remove the branches and execute this. Boom, it's gone. So basically, my query really specifies what I want in the results in terms of objects. And I can dive I can dive pretty deep into the substructures of these objects, and I'll, I'll go a little bit into how this is done. Um, here, there are also things like, uh, I won't get into too many details, but you can have reusable parts of queries that are called fragments, and then you can just reference these fragments inside your queries to avoid repeating and copy-pasting things. So that's a very quick um, example of this. Now, uh, here, I don't know if this will work if I do this here. Yeah, so one of the nice things about this, uh, this site is that you, you have all the completion also. So you can basically say, okay, give me all the information about uh, the fields that are available, and then I, I can just, uh, you know, uh, put them inside. And the other thing that's really neat, let me just move this, um, is the docs part where basically uh, on the right side, you can see uh, here I have like the query uh, that I can, can do. Let's go to the GitHub API, and I can say, okay, I want to do a query on the user. I want to see what the, uh, so the user uh, type has for fields. I can dive into that. Uh, this, is, this is really neat because this is all part of the GraphQL standard. Uh, uh, so all this, this, this is done through the schema. And uh, documentation can be basically done through the schema also. So it makes it very easy to provide not only an API, but also, let's say, part of a documentation at the same time. <clears throat> so that's for a very quick uh, demo. So diving in a little bit deeper. So basically, the schema is the first part that I've talked about. Uh, so it specifies objects, uh, field objects, I mean object fields, sorry, uh, arguments that you can have on fields and directives, and other things like interfaces, unions, and so forth. So there's quite a lot of different types of objects that are already in the structure of QL. Um, interfaces make it possible to say that uh, an object it complies to multiple different interfaces at the same time. Uh, and that makes it more to do casting also. So this is really interesting because you can say, okay, I want to get a result. I know this result will probably be of this type of interface. So give me the fields that are specific to this interface. Uh, so you can do a lot of very advanced things uh, in terms of uh, how you use the schema. Arguments, uh, I'll get back to those, uh, but I think this is the uh, one of the biggest difficulties I have in terms of understanding uh, GraphQL. So I'll try to make it as clear as possible. But if you have issues with that, please don't hesitate to, uh, to ask. So here on the right side, what we see is uh, the schema is on the right, and on the left is an example of a query. Okay. So basically, uh, on the query, I'm basically saying, okay, I want the, uh, for the hero object, I want the name. Inside the name, uh, inside the hero object, uh, let me do this right. Uh, so I have friends uh, inside the hero object, and these friends have other fields. This is an example where you're referencing another instance of an object. So GraphQL makes it possible to go through the tree of objects just when in your query. And you can actually, uh, you'll see, do this dynamically. It doesn't have to be uh, a direct reference between your object server side. It can be dynamically resolved. Fields are really the key to understanding GraphQL. This is not how they explain it, but this is how I finally got it. <laughs> uh, the way it's 
explain right now, it's pretty abstract. It's, it's not very uh, great in terms of how you actually use existing objects or systems. So a field can be either a static value, that's a really basic case, or it can be a value that results from code. And this, I think, is the most important part. Um, so given that, argue, uh, uh, fields can have arguments that will act like met, uh, are parameters to a method call. So if I have a field like um, a hero, and then I pass in parentheses ID, uh, it's Colin, uh, you know, uh, Superman. Uh, then basically it's like I'm calling a call hero that takes a parameter this ID. Okay. And then I'm resolving the, an object of type, uh, character. That's the return of my method. If you understand it that way, you'll get the power of this thing because it makes it possible to do all kinds of different connections to different objects in this, in a query. Uh, that's what took me a lot of time to, to understand. Uh, you, you can view the arguments also as constraints to filter the data to say, okay, this is the data I'm interested in. But honestly, the specification doesn't go that far. It just says you're providing a method that resolves this type of object given the argument. And it doesn't care what the arguments are. Uh, but the arguments are also specified in the schema. So you yeah. have to say, uh, this argument is type string, this argument is type uh, hero or whatever. And you also have uh, directives that are uh, that can make field conditional, meaning that uh, you say, okay, the field will appear if such and such um, uh, directive is true or not, like include or skip or, or hide or something like that. Directives are uh, not very specified for the moment. Uh, uh, they've specified two, include and a skip. Uh, but they say that it can be open-ended, so servers can provide new directives that they recognize and support. <clears throat> so, queries specify uh, what fields are part of the results. So, you basically, this is what you see here. We're saying, if you don't specify a field, it will not appear in the result. Okay, so it's, this is quite the opposite of what you do in REST, where if you don't specify a field, it will probably well, you don't know. Either it will be there or not. But you really don't know. Um, you can only specify fields that are in the schema. If the fields are not in the schema, you cannot request them. The query will fail. Uh, so as I said, fields are the result of computations. Uh, they may specify arguments that will uh, constrain the result. I'm sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, I talked about the directives. You can also set uh, use variables, meaning that instead of Having the ID be a specific value like 10, I could say it's a variable, and then you specify the value for that variable along with the query. <laughs> uh, fragments, I talked about those being able to, if you have like uh, uh, themselves often and you want to avoid that, you can just use fragments. And typecast is really what is really interesting because you can say, okay, I, if I know an object uh, that can be of different types, I can cast it to a specific object type and request those fields for that specific object type. So that solves some of the problems that we're having uh, integrating this in DX. Well, at least are some of the things we're discussing with uh, with Tess Lapin, uh because uh, of the way we're mapping content uh, through this type of API. But this is, let's say, very, very early on. Uh, but it's one solution that could be, and I really want to mention it because uh, I wasn't aware of this until Chris mentioned it yesterday, and it changes a lot of things. If you can do typecasts, you can do a lot of things that I don't think is possible with that. You know. um, and pagination is also very interesting because uh, basically this, if you look at GraphQL, you will not find any references to pagination, but uh, there is a project that uses GraphQL called Relay that does specify how to do pagination. So it just defines a, a standard schema uh, that you have to use. And then a Relay, which is a library that top, sits on top of uh, GraphQL, will know how to do that if, it, if that schema is, is defined. Now, uh, GraphQL is not only about reading or requesting data. You can also modify data. And the way this works is what they call mutations. Uh, 
And so it's incredibly similar to query, actually. The only difference is that basically you say, um, you define uh, a mutation that takes parameters, uh, which are actually arguments, and uh, then some magic happens and it gives you a result. So when I say if some magic happens, that means that you're actually implementing whatever this mutation does. Uh, so the, here they give you an example of, uh, of creating a review, uh, uh, so specifying the, uh, the episode, the review text, and then I get back as a result the stars and commentary of uh, an object that's actually an episode, I think, so, or, uh, or a movie. Uh, so what it means is that for each mutation, there is a result of a certain type. And I'm specifying, again, with the same query syntax, uh, uh, same syntax of the queries, sorry, I want in this result. So this is really used to create new content. Uh, any kind of method calls that you want to perform are basically mutations. I think one of the best ways to understand a lot of this is just to compare it to REST API. Uh, so for example, in the REST API, which of course REST again is itself not a standard, it's more like a way of doing things, but, uh, but basically in REST, you really have this notion of uh, specifying a URL structure, uh, where you're saying basically uh, my URL structure represents these types of, let's say, uh, objects or endpoints that will point to some kind of object in the back end, and then I'm performing uh, CRUD operations like read, uh, write, delete, all of these objects, and these are all mapped to URLs of some way. Um, this proves relatively uh, interesting at first, but it also has this limitation. So GraphQL does not specify anything about URLs. I mean, in all the slides I've shown you, like, you haven't seen a single URL. <clears throat> now, uh, on the opposite side, uh, REST doesn't specify anything about the request or response body structure. Uh, it's really up to whatever framework you're using. So it could be JSON, it could be XML, it could be uh, multi-part data, anything. Um, and uh, in the response, normally, uh, nowadays, it's mostly JSON that's used, but in the old days, it was XML. Uh, but uh, GraphQL, it, on the opposite side, really specifies uh, what's going on through the body. Uh, so whether it's the query, the variables, um, and the response. Also, because we're using a schema, um, there's GraphQL does validation, and REST cannot. Um, in terms of key value store, uh, being friendly to that, REST, of course, is because it's extremely uh, open, let's say. Uh, GraphQL is not that friendly to it. There are ways around this, but uh, from the start, mapping, I mean, uh, using a, a dictionary or a map directly with GraphQL is a little bit of a strange thing. So it's not perfect in that regard. And the biggest issue, uh, at least personally, I've had with uh, REST APIs is that as soon as you get out of the usual uh, create, write, update, and delete methods, you run in trouble with the uh, REST API because how do you specify how you're calling a method? It's basically, everybody does it a different way. And uh, in, uh, in GraphQL, it's mutations. Basically, you use mutations for that. So it's extremely simple how you actually uh, basically call some kind of method. <clears throat> so I want to talk now about the uh, how do you integrate this uh, with existing systems. So I'm first going to talk about um, the, uh, uh, let's say, the standard way in terms of GraphQL, because this is really the stack where GraphQL came from. And uh, so you see GraphQL here sitting between the client and the server. I'm, I'm put client because this could be either a web browser or a native application. It could be like a mobile native mobile application. It could be a desktop application. It doesn't really matter, but uh, it doesn't have to be just a web browser. Um, so GraphQL is actually something that was part of Relay. Uh, but that was extracted out of it because it doesn't have requirements to, to be used with Relay. Um, and um, I'll talk about Relay in the next slide. And on top of that, we, you have the view, which is React Native, 
which React Native being the, the version of React that makes it possible to build native mobile applications. And so this is really where it came from. It doesn't mean it's the only way, but this is really where uh, it came from. And then GraphQL exposes what's inside the server in terms of data and services. So just a few words about Relay. So um, here, this is really something I copied from the web page. So it doesn't mean you know that it's the only way you can use it, but basically to say it's a framework for building data-driven React applications. Um, it, at least in this version right now, there is a dependency to React, but there's already another implementation of Relay that does, has no reference to React whatsoever. So you don't have to necessarily think of uh, Relay as being completely tied to React. Uh, that's probably not going to be, if it's the case now, it's not going to be the case very long. Um, so the thing is that really the idea is that you don't communicate with the data store using an imperative API. So that means that you're not calling methods to get stuff or, or using a, a, um, you know, like a URL structure. Uh, this is, but this is basically where they use GraphQL. Um, so as I said, the, the queries live next to the views that rely on them. So, Basically, this is relates ties everything together. It sits between the view system and the GraphQL system. And um, what's really interesting is the aggregate queries uh, to reduce the number of back and forth you do with. And what also is interesting is that it provides caching. So you could, as you can see, GraphQL. If you, if you structure your GraphQL, let's say in a smart way, you should be able to cache a lot of it, because normally, yeah, people are doing the queries, not mutations. It should change too often. Um, and of course, uh, mutations, as I said, uh, in the case of mutations, uh, Relay even offers uh, things like a preventing double submits or stuff like that. So it, it's, it extends the schema by providing uh, transaction IDs and making sure that you're not repeating these transactions. So this is a blog post I found uh, that talks about using uh, Relay with Angular 2. Uh, it's interesting because you could use GraphQL directly on top of Angular 2, but it might also be interesting to use Relay on top of Angular 2. Okay, now uh, we are going to switch to the server uh, because that's really uh, also what we're interested in. Uh, so the very nice, I'm, I haven't talked about all the libraries that are around uh, GraphQL. There is a ton of libraries around GraphQL, which is really amazing considering how young it is. Um, but in Java here, uh, which I'm sorry, interesting, so the main implementation is the GraphQL Java project. So that's the one that contains all the uh, query parsers, uh, uh, all the stuff to build the schema and all these things. And then you have the GraphQL Java server, which was a really nice sur uh, surprise because it's an uh, OSGI server. So it's actually already an OSGI project, and uh, I had to work with it a little bit. And I've been submitting pull requests to them so that uh, you know it fits our needs. But uh, it's most of it is already there, which is really cool. And uh, GraphQL Java annotations, which is also extremely neat because you can basically just use Java annotations to build the scheme. So that's also a, a big time saver. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about the tooling. Um, so you've seen basically this tool, uh, which was actually used inside of uh, QL Hub, but it's a tool called IQL, and it's a, it's a React component actually that makes it very easy for uh, your queries or mutations to test them out, view the results, and also browse documentation. So this is a React component that's basically uh, reusable anywhere. So as features, uh, as you saw, auto-completion uh, based on the schema, uh, the executions of queries and mutations. You also have, uh, no, I don't have it here, but um, there's also a little window to input the variable values. Uh, you have the result viewer and the built-in documentation browser. So I talked already about uh, GraphQL Hub, which is basically just offering you a, a way to, to play with existing APIs. Um, there's no Facebook in there, which is kind of strange because Facebook invented all, invented all of this, but I'm guessing it's because of API keys, because probably uh, Facebook does not want you to access uh, their APIs if you don't have an API key, because all stuff is public and then you can play with them. 
And uh, last but not least, there's the awesome GraphQL project that basically is a huge list of all the tooling, all of the libraries, all the implementations that you can find around uh, GraphQL. And I just put some cool examples here because this is really kind of fun uh, projects that build GraphQL APIs on top of SQL databases. So it's kind of, you know, be really old with the brand new, so it's uh, kind of cool. Okay, so. I have a little surprise. <laughs> I'm going to show you a little integration I've made on top of uh, DX uh, with GraphQL. So let's hope it still works. So you have to excuse this. This is extremely hacky, okay? So some of these things you know, are probably not in the proper place. <laughs> but uh, so basically what I've done here is in my, I'm in my site, uh, Active Space in edit mode, and I've added a new uh, GraphQL uh, tool inside my site settings. It should be in server settings, but I went very fast. I copy this in another project. <laughs> this is why it's here. And basically here, I've integrated the React component. And uh, this React component is already pre-configured to talk to uh, uh, the server components that I've deployed on my DX. So here, for example, um, I have these queries that I've uh, prepared, and I can just execute. Uh, so, I'm sorry, here there's a query and a mutation inside the same uh, source. And uh, when I use GraphQL, it'll, it'll recognize that and ask me uh, which, of, which I want to execute. So I'm just going to say, for example, I want to execute the uh, user query. And basically what this does is that in the back end, it's connected to the, uh, the Jaya user manager service. And it uses here the user key that I specified in the argument uh, to perform the lookup and give me the result. Uh, and this is where basically I've cheated a little bit because as value pairs are an issue, I'm returning a list property. So that way I can actually resolve the problem of mapping a hash map. So this was one of the prototypes I was working on because I was trying to solve these issues. But you can see these are really the live, uh, uh, the live data of this object, including the password, <laughs> which is always something we have to be careful with. Uh, and uh, so I don't know if I, I haven't rehearsed this. What's another deal? I don't know if it'll work. I've never heard this since then. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, so here we go. So you can see that it's actually you're really using the uh, the data, last name Galileo, and um, vice president and so forth. So this is uh, I'll, I'll show you afterwards how this actually works uh, on the back end. Uh, but just so, so you see, there's really stuff already running. And now if I go in the mutation, so uh, this I'm cheating right now. I'm not, not actually modifying the JCR content because I haven't gotten that far. Uh, but uh, just so you see that it actually does something. So here, if I I call create node, you see that I get back. Um, a, this is just identifiers I've generated. It, it doesn't actually create the node, but it's just a, I'm generating a UID and, and something. But just so you see that the actual method call that's behind it is being executed and returning the object. Now here, of course, I could say, oh, I'm not interested in the path, so I just want to execute. Uh, this without the path, and, and it is gone. So it makes it very simple to, to work with. And now what, what I found the, find the coolest is, is this part, where basically I open the docs, and then I can go start going through this and going through the fields. And you see here, I've got a root object to access the X objects and content. I go into the user field without access to users inside of DX, notably requesting them through a user key argument. And the key argument has a description too. So basically, I have my full API that's available and documented. You'll see it's, it's that much work to do that. And this tool we really need because you can just start. And of course, this is all integrated also with the auto completion. So, uh, for example, here, if I, if I do this, I get all the different fields. Uh, here I haven't put the uh, descriptions of the fields, but I would get them uh, in the little thing below if I have the descriptions for the fields. Okay, so uh, 
and that worked. <laughs> so let's go. I just want to quickly uh, finish by showing you how this works. So uh, let me try to make this a little bit bigger. So first of all, uh, so this is the source code. There's a the readme on how to install it if you want to play with it. Uh, right now, it's a project GitHub project, but uh, we might uh, make it public. I don't know. Uh, uh, it's basically, um, I mean, there's a few steps. Mostly because I'm using a fork of the Java, uh, GraphQL Java servlet. Uh, but the guy is really quick about integrating the changes I submit to him. So I keep updating the stream of whether you have to use my fork or not. But <laughs> Um, basically, uh, and then uh, you deploy it into, uh, so this only works on um, on DX 7.2 because I'm using car features to do the deployment. So if we look at the structure, um, so let's go into, so you can see here that I have three sub projects. I have a features project that's the one that just builds the feature, the car feature. So it's just an X, building an XML file. Uh, the GraphQL tool, so this is the integration into the uh, administration UI. Uh, this will save you a lot of time because trust me, I've tried to deploy Graph GraphQL with the official method. It's a nightmare. I pulled the whole world of NPM. <laughs> and uh, so this will save you a lot of time. And this, this is called user provider, but it's, it needs to change because uh, it does a lot more than just that. Um, but basically, uh, the GraphQL Java Service project is pluggable, meaning that it just listens to the OSGI registry for a mutation provider and a query provider. So these are just interfaces, okay, that you register into the OSGI registry, and the GraphQL Java servlet will recognize those and make them available automatically. So this makes it possible to extend your GraphQL uh, API using modules or, or bundle. So you don't have to build everything into a single bundle. It's really not how it works. Um, now, if you look at, um, uh, so here, I did, this was basically my first prototype. So here I'm doing the, uh, the schema definition by hand. Uh, but if I defined, um, an object uh, with annotations, I could get rid of all this and just say, uh, just you know, build the schema from this uh, Java object. But as you see here, basically I'm defining the fields, sorry, uh, uh, with descriptions and so forth. And then where the magic happens is what these data fetchers are. So for each field that I'm defining, I can define a custom data fetcher uh, that will just pull the data from wherever I want. And uh, so this, this can be anything. I mean, you, as long as you're providing the result in the proper object type, you can do anything. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, in the user data fetcher, you can see here I'm actually doing the call to the uh, Jai user manager service, and uh, then I'm populating the I'm populating an object I call uh, the XGraphQL user uh, to return it. Uh, now you don't even have to use an object; you could use maps as a result. It also works. Um, but, uh, you know, it just, it just turns out. So, um, let me get back to slides quickly. So, I talked about most of this. So, the source code is there. Um, yeah, as I said, it's accessible through other modules. So, you just have to provide your own uh, uh, providers. The schema is dynamic, meaning that uh, every time it detects a new query or mutation provider, it will update the schema. So despite the fact that the schema, I mean, until now, we've always thought about schemas as very static things. In the case of this implementation, it's, it can change all the time. Uh, it just stays static between changes, let's say. <laughs> but um, uh, so as I said, it's based on uh, the GraphQL Java servlet. And as I said, the, um, the mapping to JCR content is still uh, work that I'm looking at. Um, where one of the things that we were wondering is, can we use what's inside the constant uh, no type definitions, like the no, in the no type registry, to build dynamic schemas? Does it make sense to do that? How do you actually do that? Because there are some parts that are accessible in um, 
in the CNDs, which are not extensible inside. For example, everything that starts with a star. Uh, how do you do that in GraphQL? So this is part of what I've done with the properties, for example. So you saw I defined this way of extending it to lists. 